Consideration provided. Happening now. Tighter restrictions is what local leaders are discussing as more cases of COVID-19 pop up in and around San Antonio. We've got an update on what those restrictions could entail. And the coronavirus numbers that we are getting from Metro Health, why some vital information is not being included. Don't be fooled. It's the message the FDA is getting out to the public. What you need to know about alternative methods to fight or even beat COVID-19. We've been asked to stay home as much as possible, but what happens when you do need to venture out for essentials? Coming up, what high-touch services to be wary of and how to protect yourself. After some good rainfall, the sun is finally making an appearance again. I'll be back to talk about our temperature roller coaster, how much we'll warm up before we cool back down. Coming right up. A local brewery has switched gears. Instead of making whiskey and beer, they're now making hand sanitizer. How you can get your hands on some. The News at 5 starts right now. And first at five, Bear County, Comal County, Kendall County, Wilson County, a growing number of cases of COVID-19 are being tracked all across the state. Here in Bear County, 57 cases have been confirmed. That's according to Metro Health. That is 12 additional cases from their report this morning. We know that the city and county are holding a news conference at six o'clock. Local officials expected to issue a stay at home style order at that time. Garrett Berger has been keeping us up to date throughout the day on this new order. So Garrett, they're calling this a stay home work safe order. Any idea what all that entails? Well, we don't have all of the specifics quite yet, but what we do know is that the city manager says he and the mayor have been in contact with the other major cities in Texas. Says they want to make sure that they're as they're as uh, aligned as possible, being as consistent as possible in their message to the public and businesses. So what we're expecting here in San Antonio and Bear County, residents would have to stay at home with limited exceptions. Again, that's have to stay, not to, not being encouraged anymore. Now we'd see more businesses close down, though we don't know exactly. Places like grocery stores, gas Wait. stations. Uh, head back. We're going to head back to the studio. We'll get back with details. At All right. Obviously, we're having some audio problems with Garrett Berger. As he was saying, there aren't a lot of specifics. We do know that amid all of this, the city manager and mayor talking to counterparts in other big cities as well. Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, Houston. The city manager says they want to make sure they're being consistent in their message to the public. Uh, so the stay home, stay safe order that was issued in Dallas yesterday uh, is very similar, we think, to what the city of San Antonio is going to be doing. With very few exceptions, they're asking everyone to stay at home. You could go out to get food or medical care, and only a select number of essential businesses are allowed to keep on operating like grocery stores, gas stations, and health care providers. We're not really clear how closely these restrictions are going to match up with those in Dallas. But again, that's what apparently they're trying to do. Yeah, city officials today attempting to clear up the confusion on some testing numbers. We'll get to that in a little bit. But if leaders of different cities are talking consistency, Dallas County announced its stay home, stay safe order. Actually, yesterday it goes into effect tonight. That requires everyone to stay at home with very few exceptions, like getting food or medical care. And only a select number of essential businesses are actually allowed to keep operating like grocery stores, gas stations, and health care providers. It is not clear how closely San Antonio and Bear County's restrictions will match up then. As we were talking about, city officials today attempting to clear up confusion on some testing numbers for Bear County amid the COVID-19 pandemic. When pressed on why Metro Health is not providing the exact ages of people who test positive, Assistant City Manager Dr. Colleen Bridger said the small sample size prevents the city from releasing any sort of identifiable information about them. As for Metro Health's testing reach during this pandemic, its lab processes tests gathered in close to 30 counties, but isn't actually gathering those samples. That doesn't mean that Metro Health staff are out in other counties collecting those tests, but when state and local health officials in those counties collect the specimen, they then ship it to our lab and our lab runs those tests. And coming up tonight at six o'clock, our Dylan Collier examines what Metro Health is prioritizing moving forward and what that means for you. 
Meantime, the Department of Justice wants to continue its work amid the pandemic. The DOJ now proposing that the statute of limitations be temporarily suspended and adding video conferencing for preliminary hearings. Right now, courts are closed. Grand juries are not meeting. That means prosecutors may not get to indict criminals before the statute of limitations expires. And some criminals who've been arrested could be released. The DOJ is also seeking priority testing for federal agents and trainees. The proposals have been criticized by some lawmakers. Two attempts to pass bills through the Senate shot down by lawmakers today. Congress continuing to work overtime to pass a landmark stimulus package that could ultimately give a lot of families money. Camilla Bernal is in Washington to explain why the package has not had a speedy approval. Yes, yeah, Steve, so senators are still negotiating this massive stimulus package, but at the moment they are divided along party lines. This as Americans continue to ask not just for the economic aspect of this, but they're asking for help also on the health aspect of this pandemic. The war against coronavirus is intensifying across the country. I want America to understand this week it's going to get bad. As the coronavirus cases climb, more workers laid off. Medical supplies dwindle and doctors plead for people to isolate. Stay at home. The federal government activating the U.S. National Guard in three of the hardest hit states. California, Washington, and New York, the new center for the coronavirus crisis. New York has by far the greatest need in the nation. To save the economy from a depression, the Federal Reserve announcing an unprecedented rescue plan, including unlimited bond buying, three new credit facilities, and an upcoming Main Street lending program. The Fed says the programs will provide up to $300 billion in new financing. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill, senators scramble to negotiate the largest federal spending package in modern American history. With the nearly $2 trillion package, most adults would get $1,200 and most children would receive $500. We were this close, this close. But Democrats no. blocking the measure demanding stronger protections for workers and limitations on bailed out businesses. And our goal is to reach a deal today. Yet coronavirus is complicating matters. Several senators are in quarantine after one of their own tested positive for the virus. As you may have... And the all of this is still up in the air because of the fact that they cannot agree on loans. The problem here is that Democrats say that the loans are not going to have enough oversight when they are utilized. So they're saying this is going to be too friendly to the businesses and not friendly enough for the workers. And of course, Steve, all of this coming as many of these senators are worried about contracting that virus themselves. Steve. Camilla Bernal live in Washington. Let's see if they make a deal. Thank you, Camilla. Students and families all across the country may rely on their school counselors services for their mental health help. And now Northeast ISD is making sure their district is answering the call. Starting today, the district will have phone lines available for counseling questions or concerns. Counselors will work on a rotating basis to answer the support lines weekdays from 8 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon. The plan right now is to have at least three counselors at every high school in the NEISD to pick up the phone. These counselors prepared to help students and families. Parents, this is a great opportunity for you guys to reconnect with, the, with your child, uh, kind of have conversations with them and do as many things as you can with them. And again, uh, if you can spend time outside because we have to be at home, but it doesn't mean we have to be inside the house. The NEISD counselor adds it's better to call or reach out now because by the time you realize you need help, maybe too late. And if you think you're doing okay and you're doing fine, you should still reach out. If you're interested in speaking with counselors, we have the info on how to do so. Just search for the article right now on KSAT.com. Growing concerns over the panic buying at the grocery store forcing HEB to place purchase limits on more items. Over the weekend, the grocery chain announced each customer limited on the amount of certain frozen foods, meats and poultry and non-perishables. This in addition to product limits already placed on things like water, 
toilet paper and disinfectants. We have the full list available along with other helpful resources about COVID-19 and the latest numbers right now on our website. Just go to ksat.com slash coronavirus. As concerns over the novel coronavirus grow, so have the number of treatments falsely claiming to cure it and treat it. As Courtney Friedman explains, health officials in the Department of Justice are now combating these scams, warning con companies for selling fraudulent health products. With fears over COVID-19 growing among the public, some companies are trying to take advantage of people by claiming to have a cure. But health officials are warning the public not to fall for these claims, and the U.S. Attorney General has started to take action. On Sunday, the Department of Justice announced it has filed a civil enforcement action against the operators of the website coronavirusmedicalkit.com for allegedly offering fraudulent vaccine kits for COVID-19. Earlier, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and Federal Trade Trade Commission came out with a warning letter to seven companies for selling other unproven COVID-19 products. These products include teas, essential oils, tinctures, and colloidal silver. FDA officials say the unsubstantiated products are a threat to public health, preying on consumers and misleading them with fraudulent prevention and treatment claims, which may delay people from following sound medical advice. There are currently no vaccines or drugs approved by the FDA to treat or prevent COVID-19, though some vaccines and treatments are in the early stages of development. Health experts say those won't be available for public use for at least a year. The DOJ and FDA are warning consumers to be cautious of websites or stores selling products that claim to cure COVID-19. Listen to trusted healthcare professionals instead. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. With no known treatment, the best way to protect yourself from COVID-19 is to stay home and limit the time we spend in public spaces. But what if you do need to go out and get some essentials like food or gas? 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz on how to avoid the surfaces that everybody else is touching. If you're pumping gas, you'll need to touch the pump screen and grab the nozzle handle. Getting cash from the ATM, you'll have to push the buttons or screen. And if you go to the grocery store, you'll need to push a cart. Every one of those surfaces could potentially expose you to the new coronavirus. Research suggests that it may survive on surfaces made from a variety of materials for hours or even days. To reduce your risk, avoid touching surfaces with your fingertips. Instead, use a pen for touch screens, elevator buttons or light switches or use your knuckle or even an elbow. If you can't avoid touching high touch surfaces, you can also carry tissues with you and use them to grab a doorknob or handrail. Just be sure to throw them away after using. Another option is to use your sleeve to cover your hands or fingers. Your phone is not a public space, but you do want to clean it often. A 70% alcohol wipe is best, but Apple says you can use disinfecting wipes. Just be sure they're not too wet and avoid bleach. If you don't have that, you can use a disinfecting spray, but do not spray it directly onto the phone. Instead, spray it onto a soft cloth. And of course, even after doing any of these things, wash your hands with soap and water as soon as you can and avoid touching your face. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Democrats and Republicans. To the president has just begun speaking, giving an update on the COVID-19 virus. Let's go there live now. And large businesses that were uh, badly affected by the medical difficulty that we've had. If you had a viable business in January, we are committed to ensuring the same is true in the coming weeks. In fact, we want to make it even better than it was before, and we're doing things to help in that regard. America will again and soon be open for business, uh, very soon, a lot sooner than uh, three or four months that somebody was suggesting. A uh, lot sooner. We cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself. We're not going to let the cure be worse than the problem. At the end of the 15-day period, we'll make a decision as to which way we want to go, where we want to go, the timing. And essentially, we're referring to the timing of the opening, essentially the opening of our country, because we have it pretty well shut down in order to get rid of this invisible enemy. Two weeks ago, we moved at record speed to pass paid sick leave and paid family medical leave and approved 
$8 billion, including money for the development of treatments and vaccines, and we're doing tremendous work in both — on both fronts. The vaccines are coming along very quickly. Now Congress must demonstrate the same bipartisanship again and join together to pass the Senate bill as written and avoid playing any more partisan games. They have to get together and just stop with the partisan politics. And uh, I think that's happening. I got a call a little while ago. I guess they're getting closer. It should go quickly. And uh, it must go quickly. It's not really a choice. They don't have a choice. They have to make a deal. This should not be a time for political agendas, but rather one for focusing solely and squarely on the needs of the American people. We are going to save American workers, and we're going to save them quickly. And we're going to save our great American companies, both small and large. This was a medical problem. We are not going to let it turn into a long-lasting financial problem. It started out as a purely medical problem, and it's not going to go beyond that. We're just not going to allow that to happen. Our country was at its strongest financial point. We've never had an economy like we had just a few weeks ago, and then it got uh, hit with something that nobody could have ever thought possible. And we are fixing it. We're fixing it quickly. And I want to just thank the American people for what they've been through and what they're doing. Our country will be stronger than ever before, and we fully anticipate that, and it won't be that long. Let me provide you with an update on critical supplies. FEMA is distributing 8 million N95 respirator masks and 13.3 million surgical masks across the country right now. Focusing on the areas with the greatest need, we've shipped 73 pallets of personal protective equipment to New York City and 36 pallets to the state of Washington. In the past 96 hours, FEMA has also received donations of approximately 6.5 million masks. We're having millions and millions of masks made as we speak, and other personal protective equipment, which we will be distributing to medical hotspots. We're focused on some of the hotspots. Across the nation, we're seeing an outpouring of creativity and innovative ideas widely shared between the federal health leaders, governors, and mayors, the scientific community, and members of the private sector. Uh, really working together. Everybody's working together. I'm pleased to report that clinical trials in New York will begin existing for existing drugs that may prove effective against the virus. At my direction, the federal government is working to help obtain large quantities of chloroquine. And uh, you can look from any standpoint tomorrow in New York. We think tomorrow pretty early, the hydroxychloroquine and uh, the z -Pack, I think, is a combination, probably is looking very, very good, and it's going to be distributed. We have uh, 10,000 units going, and it'll be uh, distributed tomorrow. Uh, it'll be available, uh, and is now. They already have it. They're going to distribute it tomorrow morning to a lot of people in New York City and New York. Uh, we're studying it very closely, watching it very closely. You probably saw a couple of articles today came out where a gentleman, they thought he was not going to make it. He said goodbye to his family. They had given him the drug just a little while before, but he thought it was over. His family thought he was uh, going to die. And a number of hours later, he woke up, felt good. Then he woke up again, and he felt really good. And He's in good shape, and he's very happy for this particular um, drug that we got approved in record-setting time. There's never been anything even close to it. And I want to thank the FDA, which has been incredible, and Dr. Hahn, Stephen Hahn, highly respected man. But they're doing everything possible to increase production and available supply of these drugs, not only this drug, but also others that are coming. Uh, Rendesivir is coming from Regeneron. Uh, a couple of others are also under study. But the one that I'm very excited about right now is the one we just mentioned. And I think there's a, a real chance. I mean, again, 
We don't know, but there's a real chance that it could have a tremendous impact. It would be a gift from God if that worked. It would be a big game changer. So we'll see. But distribution starts tomorrow morning early in New York, and I think a lot of people are going to be, hopefully, they're going to be very happy with the result, but we're all going to be watching closely. It's something we have to try. It's been very, very successful on malaria, very, very successful. And uh, countries with malaria have had an uh, interesting thing happen. Uh, they take this particular drug. It's a very powerful drug. And uh, there is very little semblance of the virus in those countries. And there are those that say because this drug is very prevalent because of the malaria. So we'll see what happens. I'm also announcing that we're postponing the deadline for compliance with real ID requirements at a time when we're asking Americans to maintain social distancing. We do want to require people to go with their local DMV. We will be announcing the new deadline very soon. It's going to be announced in a very short moment. Overnight, we successfully brought home 103 American citizens after they had been stranded for 10 days in Brazil. Following a cruise, we want to thank the Brazilian government and their great president. Most of those returned were senior citizens. My administration, in cooperation with Governor Greg Abbott of Texas and the private sector, coordinated their safe return to the United States. So thank you to Governor Abbott, terrific governor, terrific man. Earlier today, I signed an executive order invoking presidential authority under Section 4512 of the Defense Production Act to prohibit the hoarding of vital medical equipment and supplies, such as hand sanitizers, face masks, and personal protective equipment. We have a lot of face masks, a lot of equipment just coming in, and we have some people hoarding. And Attorney General Barr is going to be speaking about that in a second. We want to prevent price gouging and uh, critical health and medical resources are going to be protected in every form. Under this directive, the Secretary of Health and Human Services is authorized to de designate essential health and medical supplies as scarce. So he'll designate certain supplies and medical elements as scarce. And that means it will be a crime to stockpile these items in excessive quantities, which is happening to a relatively small degree, we think. But nevertheless, it's happening. We can't let it happen. And we can't let them resell them at excessive prices, which some people are doing. Uh, very simply, we will not allow anyone to exploit the suffering of American citizens for their own profit. So we're going to be watching that with our great attorney general very closely. The Department of Justice will be aggressively prosecuting fraudulent schemes related to the pandemic. Yesterday, federal prosecutors took action in their first case, shutting down a website selling a totally fake vaccine, if you can believe that one. As president, I will always fight to protect Americans from being exploited, thankfully. All throughout the country, we're witnessing extraordinary acts of compassion, benevolence, and unity. Construction companies are donating masks by the hundreds of thousands. Manufacturing workers are transforming their assembly lines. Citizens are volunteering to deliver food and medicine to the elderly. We're truly seeing America at its best. We're really seeing things that people never thought even could happen. Frankly, we never thought this could happen. But the way uh, most Americans are, are working toward getting it solved and, and just doing what they have to do to make this go away has been incredible. It's been incredible. I want to take a moment to thank the everyday heroes who are making our vast effort against the virus possible. And thank you to the healthcare workers and the first responders. These are very brave people. Thanks also to the hardworking men and women of Federal Express, UPS, the United States Postal Service and the truckers who are maintaining our supply chains and supply lines. Uh, we thank you very much. Great job. We also want to give our regards and thanks to everyone at our grocery stores working the night shift so that shelves can be restocked 
and the restaurant workers and delivery drivers keeping our families fed. Uh, so many of these restaurants, it's incredible. They're doing uh, service where people come and they pick it up. Uh, delivery, I mean, it's been incredible what they've been doing. Totally different business they, than they were in, other than they cook food. Other than that, it's like a totally different business. Most of all, I want to thank the American people for rising to the challenge and showing incredible courage, determination, patience, grace, and grit. From New York to Seattle and everywhere in between, your acts of selflessness and sacrifice and ingenuity are a powerful testament to the American character. It's really being shown. It's really showing up at a level that uh, people are really respecting. All over the world, they're respecting. And the world has problems. We're at 148 countries now. 148 countries are affected by the invisible scourge. And all of the uplifting reflections of the American spirit are out there for everyone to see. Together, we will care for our fellow citizens, and we will win this war, and we'll win it uh, much sooner than people think. And we'll be back in business as a country pretty soon. You'll be hearing about that also pretty soon. Now I'd like to uh, ask Attorney General Bill Barr to say a few words, and we'll take questions in a little while. Thank you. Let me start uh, by thanking uh, you, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, for your uh, decisive leadership in this unprecedented battle to save American lives. At the Department of Justice, we're working hard to protect the health and safety of our personnel while at the same time uh, keeping our enforcement efforts at full throttle. Uh, so I'd like to thank all of my colleagues in law enforcement, not just those at the federal level, but uh, of all our state and local partners, the police officers, the sheriff's deputies who are protecting and serving their communities, often at, at great risk to themselves. Um, what I'd like to do here is start with a few remarks about the order that the president mentioned uh, to ensure the availability of critical medical uh, and health supplies from hoarding and price gouging. On March 18th, the President issued Executive Order 13909 invoking the Defense Production Act with respect to the health and medical resources needed to respond to the spread of COVID-19, including PPE and ventilators. We have started to see some evidence of potential hoarding and price gouging. And so earlier today, the President signed a second executive order providing the authority to address, if it becomes necessary, hoarding that threatens the supply of those necessary health and medical resources. Under Section 102 of the Defense Production Act, the President is authorized to prohibit the hoarding of needed resources by designating those materials as scarce or as materials whose supply would be threatened by persons accumulating ex ex excessive amounts. Once specific materials are so designated, persons are prohibited from accumulating those items in excess of reasonable personal or business needs or for the purpose of selling them in excess of prevailing market prices. It is a crime to engage in prohibited activity. In today's executive order, the President is delegating to the Secretary of HHS this authority to protect against hoarding by designating these critical items. Now, no items have been designated yet, and the Department